Good morning. It's good to see you all gathered here today. I hope you had a, a good morning so far, that you were able to get some rest last night. And uh, I've been praying for you all week long, that the Lord would uh, watch over you and care for you and keep you, uh, strengthen you, and even fill you with his joy. Uh, when the world certainly needs a bit of that, a bright light in the midst of the darkness, that's exactly what he says we are. He says you will shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And I've been praying that would be the case for his people, uh, certainly as we all uh, recognize our land, the world needs revival. And if that's going to begin, well, it's going to be the Lord's doing, but he will use his people as we pray and cry out to him and as we faithfully witness to him. And so I've been praying that, that we would be faithful in just that way. Uh, as we are ready for our worship this morning, we have a couple brief announcements on the back of your bulletin if you want to uh, look at those. Uh, just a reminder that the, well, first a thank you for praying for the uh, session meeting and the joint session uh, diaconate meeting yesterday. Those both went very well. We were able to talk about the budget and uh, the deacons will be putting together then their uh, final swing at that. And then the session will review and we will present it to the congregation, uh, Lord willing, before too, too long. So uh, we're always an uncertain timeline as review takes place, but uh, we'll be bringing it as soon as possible. Uh, also, the session meeting went very well. The Lord blessed us. It was a time of unity and joy, and we're thankful for that. The first announcement listed on the bulletin is that the uh, new member class will begin next Saturday. That's the 19th at 9 a.m. in the uh, fellowship hall right out behind this building. Um, let anyone know if you know they're interested. Just something to uh, be aware of. Again, we'll meet on the 19th. We'll then take the 26th off since there will be holidays and people traveling around, I'm sure, and visiting with family. And we'll resume again on, I believe it's January 2nd, the following Saturday. Uh, number two is just a reminder that we have the weekly prayer meeting in the fellowship hall for any who would like to come to that. Uh, we meet at 6 p.m. and uh, right now we're doing sort of bring your own dinner if you want to bring something to eat. Or uh, some come, uh, my family, because it's easier with the kids we've been eating earlier. And then we just come and spend time together during that half an hour. And then at 6.30 we have a brief devotion and take some prayer requests. And again, if you're, a, if you're an uncomfortable public prayer, there's no pressure there. We don't pray in circles or make everybody pray or anything like that. We just uh, bow our heads and whoever wants to is allowed to. Uh, point three uh, is a note that we will be having this year. Again, a candlelight service on the 24th. That will be right in here at 6 p.m. Um, this year, I promise to remember to have you light the candles. So last year was perhaps the first ever candleless candlelight service as we all stood awkwardly and I concluded, <laughs> concluded the service without lighting the candles. So this year we'll try and light them and uh, bring home the point of the message. I think that's it in terms of announcements unless I've forgotten something there. Okay, well then uh, let's begin our worship service with our call to worship which you can find inside the front cover of your bulletin and that comes to us today based on a portion of psalm 130 it is a responsive call i would invite you to please rise for that if you would i wait for the lord wait for him more than watchmen for the morning O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and great is when my Amen. Let us worship the Lord this morning, hoping in him and in his word. Would you join me as we bow our heads and we pray, asking him to bless us in his worship today. Our Father in heaven, we do look for you more than watchmen for the morning. Lord, apart from you, we have no hope in this world. Apart from you and the things you have made known in your word, we are but particles of dust who impossibly came from nothing, are spiraling towards nothing, and have no meaning and no purpose. Uh, but this, of course, is not so. Lord, you are the God who has always been. And you spoke, and by the word of your power, you made all things, and that very good, in the space of six days. And still today, Lord Jesus, you sustain all things by the word of your power. You have spoken powerfully also, Lord, in the written word and declared a message of salvation, good news to those who were lost and wandering in the darkness so that upon us who have believed a light has dawned. And Christ has come to release the prisoners, to set free the captives, to give us liberty 
from sin and its bonds, that we might know and love and serve you in the freedom and the joy of the children of God now and forever. We praise you for this. We praise you, Lord, that while we were long separate from you, distant, indeed separated by our sin, cut off from the life and blessing that is to know you, you have now called us your children. You have declared that we are Abraham's descendants, your true Israel, who have believed the gospel by grace and who therefore belong to you now and evermore. Or being called your people, we are gathered here then today to obey your command to worship you, to praise you, to learn from you, and to understand the things that you have done for us and to respond with gratitude and with obedience and with faithful witness that the world might know and others might come to share in the wonderful things you have done. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us then now as we have come together according to your word, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would illumine our minds, which are lost in darkness without you, but with you are full of light and life. Awaken our hearts and our affections, that we would joyfully praise you and take our wills so easily and often stubborn and make them like soft clay in your hands, molding them according to the scripture that increasingly every thought and word would be taken captive for Christ. We pray that in all of this you would get glory and that you would receive from us the praise of thankful lips, even now. We ask it in the name of Christ, our Savior, who told us that when we pray, we ought to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would remain standing with me and take a copy of the gray hymnal, let's open together to number 216 and sing out with loud voices, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 216. to sing out to our king and to remember that he is a god of deliverance that he has indeed come to set his people free as we will hear when we come to our sermon text in john 8 this morning 
And as we hear a bit of, as we turn to our Old Testament reading, uh, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, here the Lord instructs his people in how they are to live for him and to honor him, even as he brings about a reminder of why it is they respond with this grateful obedience. Uh, first and above all, of course, because he is the Lord and is to be obeyed just because of who he is, but also, as he reminds them, because of what he has done for them. That he has not only created them, but he is the God who has delivered them from bondage in order that they might be a people for himself, free now to serve the Lord with joy and gladness. And let's hear as he speaks to us in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, this is the perfect word of the Lord. It is living and active, we are told. It cuts and divides deep within us, and it works what pleases the Lord. Uh, it can give life to the spiritually dead. And so let us, uh, with humble hearts here, and with hearts full of prayer, that God would indeed do just that. Give us life through his word. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, <clears throat> and cisterns that you did not dig, and graveyards, or excuse me, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, <clears throat> the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God is in your midst, in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, as you tested him at Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may go well with you, and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has promised. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. Amen. Well, this is the word of the Lord, and that he bless us in hearing it this morning. A wonderful uh, promise from the Lord, uh, not as I, as I stumbled and said to give them graveyards, but to give them vineyards, <laughs> vineyards, a land full of milk and honey uh, to bless them and to care for them as they served him with gratitude because he had delivered them. He had 
formed them by the word of his power, yes, but he had also brought them out from under a crushing slavery an overwhelming burden, and he had delivered them and said, you are free now, and you're free in order that you might be my people and you might serve me all your days. And this is what that will look like. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about uh, his deliverance and the freedom that he gives as we turn to our sermon text in John chapter 8. Uh, we'll be reading from verse 31 to uh, 36. But before we do that, let's uh, turn to the Lord and pray that he would enable us to understand and to receive his word this morning. <clears throat> oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the scriptures inspired, breathed out uh, by you, our God. And we praise you for the uh, consistent reminders throughout your word uh, that nothing is to be added to it, nothing is to be taken from it that your words are pure, that your word is perfect, that every word you speak proves true, that your word does not fall to the ground unfulfilled, and that you bring us forth, you cause us to be born again by the word, that you wash us with the water of the word. We thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to possess, even for ourselves, a copy of the written word of God here in our own language, preserved and passed down to us. And we thank you that we can open the Bible, something we might take for granted, and yet which is such a high privilege. And we can read words that we know are not only true, but are indeed life and liberty giving. We thank you for the Gospel of John written uh, as John expressly tells us that we might believe uh, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name. And we thank you that you work mightily by your Holy Spirit through the word as we hear it, as we read it, uh, to chop away, as it were, spiritual chains, to free us from long-established patterns of thought and uh, distorted affections, and to cause us to rightly understand the truth about you and this world that you have created, uh, about ourselves, about things that have been and are and are to come. And we thank you that uh, more than that, you powerfully work to cause us to receive these things, not only to understand them and to generically assent to their truthfulness, but to believe them. We thank you that you have promised that in this there is indeed great liberty. We pray that as we look at John this morning, you would be mightily at work in our midst. You would be taking our minds and uh, releasing them from sinful things that have held us captive, whether it is a, a pattern of thought or a, a certain behavior or something that we have loved and clung to, though we know it is wrong. We pray that you would free us, that we might serve you with joy and gladness, which is life itself. And we ask these things because we know that when your people live renewed and holy and joyful, Christ-centered, Christ-like lives, when this takes place by your grace, you get glory. We pray, Lord, that you would do these things then for your own name's sake, even as for our good, for we are your people whom you deeply love and have purchased at a terrific price. We ask it all in the name of our Lord, our Savior, our Deliverer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, well, as I said, our sermon text this morning comes to us from John chapter 8. I will read beginning in verse 31 uh, down through verse 36. Uh, as we come to these verses, the general context, again, by way of reminder, is that Jesus has been teaching, preaching in the temple treasury in Jerusalem. A uh, crowd has gathered about him, and he has been declaring things about himself. And as he have, has done these things, we were told right before our verses uh, that uh, even as he spoke, some of his hearers uh, believed him. And that's where we pick up this morning in verse 31. This is the word of God. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? 
Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. Well, this is God's word. May bless us now in considering it further together. <clears throat> the freedom. That is a, um, that's a powerful word, isn't it? Uh, freedom. If you've uh, seen the, the hit movie, you know, of course, that was the uh, last cry of uh, William Wallace in the movie Braveheart. It was something uh, for which he was willing to suffer, something for which he was willing to die. Uh, it is, of course, something that has played a, a huge and a positive role in the life of our own nation. This is uh, something that is to be respected. It's something that is to be treasured, and it is something for which many have willingly laid down their lives. Uh, for a fairly short little word, uh, it is, in fact, a very big word, freedom. And it's a word that, uh, as much as we might think it originated and has existed only in the context of the United States, uh, in fact, has been around an awful lot longer than our own nation. Uh, it's a word, for example, that uh, Jesus Christ uses in our passage this morning, and that with a very particular meaning in mind. And he, he intends for us, as we hear him use it, to take care to discern what exactly he means when he talks about freedom and to embrace that freedom, right? to understand him and to say, yes, I need that, I want that, I will have that, this freedom that he offers, he says, to all who will truly believe, right? who, will, who will put their trust in him. As we prepare to think about that and, and consider what it is that Jesus means when he talks about freedom, I think it is worth our uh, taking a very brief moment to note uh, who exactly it is that he addresses, uh, to whom he speaks here. And you notice that he speaks to those who have already professed to believe. Now, whether that was out loud or it just was a fact in their hearts that the Lord knows uh, I don't know, but in one way or another, we're told he addresses those who say that they have believed him. You see that in verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him. So he is addressing a crowd uh, among whom there are those who apparently have professed to have made some kind of a claim to believe Jesus in light of the things that he has been saying to them. Uh, primarily, that would be, according to John, that he is the promised Christ that he is, in fact, the Son of God. He's, he's the one they've been looking for. He is the one who was foretold. His coming was foretold in the pages of the Old Testament. Uh, long ago, Eve was told, one of your descendants is going to come and crush the serpent's head. Abraham was told, from you is going to come one through whom the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. David was told, your descendant will come who will sit on your throne forever. He will conquer nations and uh, he will have a kingdom that never ends. Uh, he is the one mightily anointed with the Spirit of God to do all of these things. Uh, it's no wonder that they might be persuaded of this. To this point in his ministry, he's done some very noteworthy things. Right? He's, he's turned water into wine. He uh, healed a boy who's at the point of death. He is, he's also healed an invalid, a man who had been in that state for 38 years. Uh, he fed thousands of people with a tiny little bit of fish and some loaves of bread. He, he walked on the water. And as he's done all of this, he has interwoven it with his teaching, and he has made it plain that he is claiming to be the Messiah. He is claiming to be the Christ. He is saying, I am that one anointed and sent by God into this world. And that has caught the attention of great numbers of people. You can imagine, of course, that it would. Some of them have, have even said, yes, well, this must be the Christ. This must be the Christ. He must be who he's claiming to be. They've said, I believe Jesus is the Christ. So in that sense, at least roughly, you could say they're the equivalent of uh, today's churchgoer. Right? At least on the surface, those who have said, as, as we have, I, I believe him. I believe Jesus is the Christ. As far as they're concerned, they they believe Jesus. And yet he's going to make clear that the fact that a person says, I believed, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that person has really come to believe in 
Jesus, right, to true faith in Christ. There are false professors. Nor does it mean that a person, even who has truly believed, as fully and as deeply as they ought to understand what that means and what Christ has done for them. Indeed, John often uses the word uh, believe in, in different senses throughout this gospel. If we understand that, it will help us to make sense of some of the things he says about those who believe at times. Sometimes John uses believe to talk about those who have a, a superficial faith. Those who, who believe something, but they don't actually trust in the true biblical Jesus Christ as he really is. And sometimes John uses it to refer to those who indeed have true faith in Christ. Same word, but used in different senses. Uh, in our verses, we're just told Jesus addresses those who have believed, those who have professed at least to believe. And as he does this, he says to them, well, that profession of faith that you have made will be shown true or false by the fruit in your lives. Right? What happens to you, what you do from here on out, will demonstrate whether what you've said is true or not. You look again at verse 31. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you, if you continue in your teaching, then you will show by that that you really are my disciples, my students those who learn from and, and follow me. In other words, he, he looks at them and says, as much as I know you've said you believe, we would say that's, that's good insofar as it goes, but whether this faith is the real deal, whether, whether you've really come to know and love and trust in and, and submit yourself to Jesus Christ, well, that will be made evident by your life. Now, we know, because this is very important to get the the thought pattern right here. He is not saying, if you continue in my teaching, then uh, by this you will somehow merit my love. You will become my disciples. Right? Uh, you, don't, you don't work to earn your way into Jesus' favor by reading your Bible enough or by good deeds or a holy enough life. Rather, he says, if you continue in my teaching, it will be evident that you really are my disciples. The fruit will demonstrate what kind of root you have, whether you've put your soil, your roots down in, in good soil or bad soil, whether in the ways of this world or really into the truth of Christ and his word. But the way you live will make it plain whether your faith is sincere, whether Christ has become your Lord uh, or not. So Jesus addresses those who profess to believe him, and he says uh, it's the transformation in the believer's life that bears witness to the fact that their profession of faith is a genuine. And so it's a perfect word for the church in an age where uh, superficial faith surely runs rampant. Uh, any number of churches calling themselves whatever today, evangelical, uh, are built upon little more than really sort of entertaining, feel-good, uh, you-can-live-your-best-life-now sort of messages, sort of a pep talk. Many congregations today, sadly, are nothing more than echo chambers for whatever happens to be the culturally relevant, acceptable agenda of the moment. Uh, we're told we must do this. We need to echo the culture so that we can be accepted by the culture. There are many uh, who would think of themselves as believers, and yet, because they've been perhaps misled, whether uh, they've wanted to be misled or not, and don't really know what it means to be a believer, who aren't really living the sort of life that reflects, I have become a follower of Christ, and I have the freedom that Christ gives, not grasping what he really came into the world to do, not understanding even perhaps the extent of their own sinfulness, and therefore uh, how much they need what Jesus came to do. And so failing to look to him as he really is, to give to them what they really need. Jesus uh, addresses such people well in our text as he speaks even to this crowd of, of Jews gathered in the temple. And he, he speaks in such a way as to draw a, a dividing line, as it were, to, to really cut the congregation right down the middle, revealing, well, this is what I've come into the world to do, and so this is what it really means to trust me for it. And uh, as he does this, he, he begins to draw the line by using that big word right, when he offers them freedom. 
but he offers freedom to those who profess to have believed. Now, if we were just speed reading through this, I hadn't really set it up at all uh, with the different uses of the word believe and such, we would think, well, that's an interesting thing to do. I mean, if these are those who have believed in Jesus, then whatever freedom he gives, uh, well, don't they already have it? Like, why offer it to them? But of course, as we've said, not all who believe have truly understood and believed in Jesus, or perhaps even grasped the extent of what he came to win. And so as he addresses these professing believers, he says that he will teach them the truth. In order to lead them to freedom, he says, I will teach you the truth. You read the end of verse 31 into the part of verse 32. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. A couple points worth noting. At the, the dividing line uh, between the person who is truly Jesus' disciple and the one who maybe says, I believe, but, but isn't his disciple the line he draws here is whether a person abides or continues in his word. It's, it's his word. Whether a person goes beyond that initial profession of faith and continues to study and to learn from and to put into practice Christ's word, his, his teaching, as we find all throughout Scripture. You take, for example, a large Billy Graham rally of old, right? Famous, of course, televised, many of them. Uh, he would get up, wonderful preacher, he'd preach his heart out. And at the end of these uh, rallies, it was, of course, not at all uncommon for great numbers of people to come forward and say, well, yeah, I've, I believed. Uh, but as it turns out, when later studies were done to follow up, very few of them actually went on to join a church or to any kind of maturity in the faith or greater understanding of Scripture most of them, it turns out, it was sort of an emotional experience. They were moved to do something, but then they had not really believed at all. It didn't change them. It didn't transform their lives. Some did, though. Some did believe. And for those, it showed in their lives. They, they studied the Word. They joined local churches. They, they grew, and they, they changed over time. Even so, Jesus says a, a distinguishing mark of the true disciple is that over time we continue to learn from him, to obey his word. It's not that we um, immediately become perfect, of course, or ever in this life. It's not that we never sin again. That's not going to happen until Christ comes, and we are then, in seeing him, we are told, made like him. We will be made perfect at last. Rather, this means that upon coming to know Christ and, and profess faith in him, the, the true believer demonstrates this new willingness uh, and eagerness to learn from him and to live for him. But things begin to change in their lives. Things that used to weigh them down, that they couldn't seem to get by, they begin to get by them. They begin to live a renewed life. And it continues throughout their life. They abide in his teaching. When this happens, he says, something happens for that person who continues to study from him and learn from him and follow him. He says they will know the truth. They'll know the truth. Uh, the truth, of course, about salvation, right? the, the, the basic gospel, if you will, right? the person who listens to Christ, who pays attention to what he says, uh, God willing, will come to understand what he came to win, what he came to give through his life and his death, but also the greater body of his teaching found all throughout his word, what the Lord is like. There are all kinds of false messages in the world about what God is like, what this world is like. Even you listen to news reports or papers that are written, there's an underlying worldview assumption about what we're like, what the point of life is. If you abide in my word, you'll be able to cut through a lot of the falsehood out there. You'll under, understand how it is that you're really supposed to live, what the, what the point of your life is. And you'll understand how God has equipped you to live that life so that you actually can do it now. Knowing the truth means what Jesus speaks about in the Great Commission then, when he says people are to become disciples, go and make disciples, but then they're also to learn to obey all that he has commanded. That's what he means when he says a person who abides in his word will know the truth. So to those who say they believe in him, when he says, I'm the Christ, the, the Son of God, he offers to teach the truth. 
And that is where uh, his word comes in when he says, by this truth, he will set us free. He will set us free. Verse 32, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus, via his word, will free us. That um, what implies something, doesn't it? Uh, Calvin notes that. If you read his comments on this. It implies something, that our, our natural state is one in which we need free. At least ever since the fall in the garden. Right? Our, our natural state, as it is now, is not one of freedom, but one in which we are captive in some way. He's looking at people who've said, we believe, and he's saying there are chains around you that, that prevent you from living the kind of life you've been designed to live, from even understanding that life the way you're supposed to understand it. He tells us we need to be freed from something that would prevent us from living faithfully and fruitfully for the Lord. As he speaks to those who have professed to believe in our verses, he offers this freedom. I've come to set you free, he says. And yet you, you notice something tragic about the crowd in verse 33. Uh, they're completely blind to the fact that they're enslaved, that they need to be set free. They're, they're blind to it. Verse 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? They don't, they don't see the reality of their situation. Their response to this wonderful offer of freedom is, we're Abraham's descendants. We are Israelites. We're, we're God's people. We've never been enslaved. You think, well, oh, really? <laughs> you know, that's, that's an interesting thing to say. What about Pharaoh in Egypt? What about what we read about in Deuteronomy 6 this morning? What about 70 years in Babylon? Or what about their current subjection to Rome, even as they say those words? Not to mention the, the unbearable burden of the Pharisees' rules and regulations. But slavery has been a frequent reality for the Israelites, and yet in this proud blindness, right, they, they don't see it. Jesus, Jesus offers them freedom, and they, they're saying, we don't need that. Much less will they see the real issue of which he is speaking, which is, of course, the bondage of their own spiritual condition. They don't see it. They're enslaved right now. Not, not referring to uh, Rome, though that would be true, and not to the endless rules of the Pharisees, though that would be true, but to a much worse taskmaster. Right? They're enslaved to sin. Sin, it promises us happiness. It promises us freedom. Right? You can be your own person. You can be who you want to be. Do, do whatever you want to do. Live out your dreams. It promises happiness and freedom, but then it always delivers misery and death in the end. They don't see this, that they're captive to their own wicked hearts. They're ruled by their lusts and their desires. They're free in a sense, of course, but only to do what is right in their own eyes. They're not free or able to turn and to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. And that is true freedom. That's life. That's blessing. That's peace. That's the life we were designed to live. But here they are enslaved to sin, taken captive by the devil. And, and because sin, when it binds us and wraps its chain around us, it, it, it darkens and blinds and biases the mind. Because of this, they don't even see it. So here are people who have seen something in Jesus. They can't deny there's something special about this man. They believe he is someone great. But they don't understand what he really came to do, this freedom that he came to win. And how great is their need of that freedom? So when he offers to set them free, they basically say, what are you talking about? We don't need to be set free. Yeah, we'd like someone to come and take care of these pesky Romans, set up a kingdom for us. That'd be great. You know, you could use some of these great powers of yours to kind of make us lords in the earth. You could get rid of our political opponents. They are a bother. Fix our problems. Give us a better life. They'll have that. They'll have this worldly deliverance of sorts. But, of course, that's not what Jesus is offering when he speaks of freedom. They have a Jesus in mind, the sort of man they think he is, the same sort that many today would be very happy to have. It's possible you 
don't know, you know, it, many people think of Jesus and say, well, I, I would love to have someone like that who can, he can provide me with what I want. He could make me healthy or happy, wealthy. He could give me political victory because he is mighty. But a Jesus who confronts me right, about my own sins and my shortcomings and a Jesus who, who says to me, you are in spiritual peril and you will surely perish apart from him. A Jesus who wants to teach me and, and change me, who actually comes to me and says there are some things in your heart and your life that need to be changed and I want to help you with that. Oh, no thanks. I don't, I don't want a Jesus who affirms me, right? I want a Jesus who will fix things that upset me out there, but free me. From what? I'm not the problem, people would tend to say. The issue is not in here. It's out there. Right? I'm not enslaved. If anything, I'm oppressed by all this stuff that is bothering me. Somebody could come and free me from that, I guess. That's not the sort of thing Jesus is talking about when he says, I offer you freedom. It is true, of course, one day he's going to make all things new. We look forward to that. But he, there's not going to be anything out there to trouble us anymore. So he will free us from all of that. Uh, the world will be remade in perfect righteousness. There will be no evil thing that will enter in in that day. There will be no sickness, no pain, no sorrow. There won't be unjust oppression. This is wonderful, but that's all, it's, it's all downstream. It's the effect of the central deliverance that he came to win. And that is deliverance, not first and foremost from what bothers us out there, but rather from what binds and enslaves us in here. That's our greatest problem, the, the problem of sin. Sin that uh, it separates us from God, it ensnares and entangles the heart, and it stands ready to condemn the unbeliever. And sin that even though it is forgiven, of course, still troubles the believer. We, we remain in this battle with it, seeking to be rid of it all our lives long. And therefore, as he, he speaks to these crowds in our text, and also, of course, to us this morning, Jesus offers freedom from sin. Right? Freedom from sin even to those who profess to have already believed. Because, of course, if that's not the freedom a person desires and understands that they really need, then that person has not really believed in Christ at all. And so he speaks and prays him. Still in mercy, he speaks today in his word, and he offers this freedom. He says, I offer to you freedom from sin's guilt. There is freedom from sin's guilt. In verse 35, he speaks to the one who's, who's utterly caught in the bonds of sin, having never found freedom in Christ. And he calls this person a slave. Right? And he contrasts this state of slavery to sin with what he is offering to those who will trust in him. Right? There's a warning. He says the slave does not remain forever. The son remains forever. That is, uh, in the house of the Lord. In the family of God. He says the one who is still captive to their own passions like they're just running along as the rest of the world is they they're defiled with sin's guilt going their own way this person is not a son of god he says this person is a slave of sin i have no right or reason to expect uh, that they will be allowed to live with the lord forever here is the god who is holy 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 he, he's called uh, a consuming fire the person who is still entangled in the snares of sin, he's saying, will not enter his holy heaven upon death. They will not enter the new heavens and the new earth when Christ comes and makes all things new. They'll be, they'll be cast away as strangers, drugged in everlasting chains to hell. That's a terrible end. It's a frightening word, and yet the... The good news is that to those who are in that exact position, Jesus speaks in our verses and he says, it doesn't need to be your end. It doesn't need to be that way. Indeed, all who will humble themselves and confess this state of slavery to sin. I am, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm bound by it. I can't free myself and I'm guilty. And who will then ask him, Lord, set me free. Free me from the guilt of this sin. He says, well, this person can know 
that that condemnation will not be their end. And why? Well, because of what Jesus came to do. He came to free us from that guilt by, by going to the cross in our place. Because of that guilt that condemns you, that sin that wraps about you and would drag you into the pit. I'll take it off of you. I will, I will put it onto myself. The chains would be wrapped around Christ as he was made a curse for us on the cross, we're told. He was made sin for us. And he died, our substitute. And there he was suffering what we ought to suffer. And he redeemed us through this. And he redeemed us. He purchased our freedom from slavery, from sin's condemning power by shedding his blood, that great price for our liberty. And on that basis, he comes to the sinner and he offers freedom, freedom from the guilt of sin. It's what he came to win. It's what he still offers today to everyone who hears the gospel as we go and tell this good news. He says, you can be free from the guilt of sin. And he offers freedom from sin's power. Verse 34, after his hearers have denied that they're enslaved, Jesus makes it clear, well, no, you are still held fast in, in spiritual chains. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Those who uh, go through life living only for themselves and uh, not for the Lord, who just freely do whatever they want, whatever they desire in any given moment, well, yeah, they, they have the ability to do what they want again, but not the ability to desire and to submit to the Lord. So they're not really as free as they think. Right? In fact, they can only run in one direction, and that is their lustful hearts. Wherever it drives them, they are captive. Sin rules over them. Now, the, the believer, of course, is not in that state of absolute spiritual bondage. The, the believer is not in that state. We refer to that, of course, as total depravity, what it is to just be gripped and consumed by sin. That is not the believer's condition, but we are still engaged in this ongoing war with remaining sin. And we're told that's going to be present for as long as this life goes on. And so the believer also continually needs to look to Christ for this freeing power to help us, Lord, to help me put sin to death, help me live for you from now on. I don't want to keep doing this thing that has plagued and bothered me for so long. And so to all who will truly believe in him and follow him, who will begin and then, and then continue to learn from Christ and his word and, and to walk in his ways, he says, you can have freedom from sin's power. Verse 32, continue in his word, he says, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Verse 36, if the, the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Freedom from guilt of sin, yes. But here he's saying also freedom from sin's power. Yes, free to no longer fear sin's judgment, its condemnation. But also free in a way the world would never conceive of freedom. Free to stop living for yourself and your own sinful desires. Free now to start living for the Lord in this sweet and personal and lively relationship where he is your father and your comforter and your guide and you you willingly follow him that's what the heart that truly comes under conviction of sin realizes it needs and by god's grace it begins to desire this person the spirit is working through the word showing us the truth about god and and our own condition because we desperately want to be forgiven for sin but it's more than that. It's more than I want my get out of hell and go to heaven ticket. This person also desperately wants to be freed from sin and its, its shackles. So the, the true believer does not think of freedom as freedom to continue living in sin. You remember Paul's words. Should we just continue in sin? Grace abounds when we do that. God forgives us and gets glory. So we should just keep sinning, right? He says, God forbid. God forbid. We, we've been forgiven We've been shown mercy. We've been loved. Let us respond with a willing obedience, right? The heart that says, hey, I've, I've been forgiven. I don't have to worry about hell. I can do whatever I want. That's not the regenerate heart at all. Rather, it's the one who's come to know and begun to follow Jesus. This person says, I want, I want freedom from sin in all its aspects. I don't want anything more to do with it. 
Lord. I want to learn from the Lord. I want to learn about the Lord. I want to spend time in the Bible so I, I, I can be close to this God and understand how I am to obey him. I want to read books on theology and faithful Christian living so that I grow and mature in my faith. I don't remain this milk Christian, but I become a meat Christian, able to understand and put into practice more difficult things because I'm growing. I want to be a member and participate in the local church because I know there I'm encouraged and I grow and I get to help others do the same thing. That's the, the believer's desire. Freedom from sin, period. And so the simple question is, is that uh, your desire today? Is that what you want? I, I want to be forgiven. Yeah, good. I also want to be freed. Is that what you, you've trusted Jesus Christ and are continuing to look to him day by day uh, to provide for you? You recognize that as your greatest need. You see, my biggest problem, and may have problems in your life, the believer is assured we'll have our share of trials, tribulations, but you realize your biggest problem from which you need deliverance is not external to you, but internal. It's not all that those bad people out there are doing. It's what I am still wrestling with in here and the sin that confounds me and against which I need to fight. And I realize that uh, what we need is not an easier or more comfortable life. It's holiness. Right, growth and holiness. If not, then it's a good opportunity to take a look at uh, our passage this morning again, to read through it uh, this afternoon and pray, Lord, help me to understand what Jesus means when he says he came to give me freedom and help me to want it. Help me to see my need for it and to desire it. Ask him, give me eyes to see and faith to believe, Lord. But if that is your desire, well then, I want to encourage you to, to praise him today, right? to thank him. In looking to the Son of God by faith, you've, you've not only been forgiven for your sins, that means now and forever, but he has made and he's continuing to make you free from sin's enslaving power. You don't have to be the person you've always been. You don't have to live the life you've always lived. You don't have to recommit the sins you've struggled with and seem to circle back around to again and again. One day, yes, sin will be entirely vanquished and you'll be there. You'll be there to celebrate in that day. But even now, Christ has put his spirit in you. He has given you a new power right, to conquer sin, any and every sin through the Spirit who lives in you. And so when the Hebrew, or author to Hebrews says to us, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race before us. Right? Let us run along the path that is the Christian life. You can do that. But that's not beyond the, the scope of your ability anymore because Christ has freed you. You can live a holy life. There, there is no sin that you must commit. None. By abiding in his word, reading, praying, worshiping, doing his word. Uh, you really can be the kind of person the believer longs to be. A, a renewed, joyful, Christ-centered, God-glorifying person. You're free. He, he bought you by his blood. You're, you're, you're free to serve him. Free to change your attitude and the way you speak and live. You're free to resist sinful trends in our culture. And you're free to resist sinful tendencies in yourself. You're free to go about doing good. You're, you're free so that you can go live a whole life that can be described as worship. And that is a life that will be full of true joy. As for freedom, we're told that Christ has set us free. If you, if you believed in him, you are free today. Praise him for it and then show it by going out of here and continuing in his word. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we, we do confess the reality declared in your word that our first parents being free to love and live with and fellowship with you in the garden chose instead rebellion chose disobedience instead of life and blessing and peace and freedom 
chose slavery, sin, misery, and death. You tell us, Lord, we are conceived in sin, brought forth in iniquity. We are going astray from the womb. And so, Lord, we have added our assent, our amen, as it were, to their sin in our own lives and continued to wrap chains about ourselves. And we praise you that you did not look upon us in this condition and say, if you have tied yourself to a heavy steel anchor, then you will sink. But you came instead and you burst those bonds which held us. You took away the guilt of sin as you laid our condemnation upon the Son of God. And you broke the power of sin as you sent your own Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to renew our hearts, to create in us new desires, to live for you. You have told us that that old anchor has been chopped away and You've replaced it with a new, a far better anchor. That is Christ who has gone behind the veil into the holy places. You have knit us together with him. You have wrapped about us a golden chain, as it were. Christ at the other end, the eternal life, our end. We praise you for this. We thank you that you tell us, because all of this is so, even now we are called holy and we can be holy. And we pray that you would help us to do that, Lord, that we would go about living a life that shows Christ has set me free. I am not who I was. I belong to the Lord, and I will freely serve him as long as I live. And we pray that others would see and be curious about this transformation and that we would speak openly of it. And we would tell the hard to hear news, which many reject, as those in our text this morning, that the world is held fast in bondage. And yet we would also declare the good news, that Christ is a redeemer, that he is a deliverer of those who look to him in faith. Lord, through this, would you grant many to hear, to believe, and to be set free. And may the praise be yours, our, our God, our Savior, our deliverer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go out and part this morning, may grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen.